evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Uh, we've, uh, it's a fascinating story of a really interesting railroad and a lot of uh, relevance to uh, the town of Greenwood Lake, the village of Greenwood Lake, the town of West Milford and Ringwood. So I'm very happy that we're talking about this through the uh, Greenwood Lake Public Library. The book is available through the Garbelli Publishing Company. And uh, I really recommend it. Thank you. But the Montclair and Greenwood Lake Railroad uh, ran from Jersey City to Kearney, Bloomfield, Montclair, Wayne, Wanaku, Ringwood, and West Milford. It served the iron mines in Ringwood. This railroad was only about 50 miles long, but it had two branch lines, a third branch line to the Ringwood mines. The railroad operated steamboats on Greenwood Lake. There was a connection to a small narrow gauge line, a huge variety of trains, um, different variety of operations. They passed through a number of different owners, survived two bankruptcies. It survived the flooding of the Passaic River in the Wayne area. It was almost submerged by the Wanakee Reservoir. And there are even stories about UFO sightings. But the story begins with the Newark and Bloomfield Railroad that was completed in 1855. The railroad linked the town of Bloomfield to the um, to, to the um, Morris and Essex Railroad, which took passengers on to Jersey City and to the ferries to New York. It was purely a local line that was intended to provide for the citizens of Bloomfield. Right about that time, Abr uh, the Iron Master at Ringwood, Abram S. Hewitt, and his partner, Peter Cooper, had been expanding their iron holdings. And on this map of Northern New Jersey, we see the red circle here is the location of Ringwood Manor. They, Cooper and Hewitt relied on the Morris Canal to transport their iron out of Ringwood and all to their works in Trenton. But the Morris Canal's feeder only extended as far north as Pompton, which was still several miles short of the ironworks at Ringwood. Meanwhile, the people, what would become Mont, the town of Montclair, looked at the Newark and Bloomfield Railroad and asked if it could possibly be extended a few miles into what would become the village of Montclair or into what was, would become the town of Montclair, excuse me. Here's a photograph of the Newark and Bloomfield's main passenger station in the town of Bloomfield. And here is a photograph of from the 1880s at what is today Upper Montclair. And you can see the town is not particularly densely populated. There wouldn't be a lot of business for a railroad extending up into Montclair and Upper Montclair. But in 1868, Montclair would finally get its railroad after some 12 years of waiting. And it was entirely due to this man, Julius H. Pratt. Pratt had become quite rich in his family business of supplying ivory and cellulose products. And he got together with four of his friends. They were dissatisfied with the service of the Newark and Bloomfield, and they sought a charter to extend the Newark and Bloomfield into the town of Montclair. So the plan was that four local men, purely looking out for the welfare of their neighbors, we're going to build a $2 million railroad so that, 2000, so that 200 commuters in a village of 2,000 people would have better train service. It didn't fool anyone. Pratt formed the syndicate and he and his partners then sold to the New York Midland Railroad, the parent company of the New York Oswego Midland. Having snuck a charter through 
the state legislature by pretending it was purely a local road. Their plan was to build a railroad to the shores of Greenwood Lake and then extend north to Oswego, New York, a port on Lake Ontario. Now, in order to build this railroad, we needed a town. We needed to have a town of Montclair that would sell railroad bonds. And so in 1868, what became the town of Montclair broke off from Bloomfield, incorporated itself as, a as the town of Montclair and began selling bonds to construct the Montclair Railroad. So the plan went something like this. The town of Montclair would sell bonds. Now, this was not taken, this was not um, subject to a vote. The town simply obtained the consent of three quarters of the town's property owners. So the town of Montclair would sell bonds to finance the construction of the Montclair Railroad to Greenwood Lake. Money from the bond sales would purchase railroad income bonds. The railroad would pay revenues back to the bondholders. So the town of Montclair and the people who bought bonds would get their money back. Unfortunately, if there were no revenues, Montclair would be responsible for the debt. So keep that, keep that in mind. Just as the railroad got out of Montclair, it faced its first major challenge when a group of angry Bloomfielders were planning to attack the building and the bridge crew that were going to build a bridge over Broad Street. The problem was the railroad proposed a bridge that was narrower than Broad Street was wide. And when the, when the building and bridge crew arrived to construct the bridge over Broad Street, the church bells would ring, the angry Bloomfielders would rush out, and they would resist the invasion of the public rights. Fortunately, cooler heads prevailed, and there wasn't a riot in the town of Bloomfield. Then the railroad, though, if it was going to build from Montclair to Greenwood Lake, had one serious vulnerability, and that is the Great Notch. Now, if you drive on Route 46, you've driven through the Great Notch a great many times. You may have even had a beer at the Great Notch Inn. The Great Notch was one of the few openings in the Trap Rock Ridge between, Cent uh, between um, Morristown and the New York border. In this line of mountains here, there are only two openings. One is at Suffern, the other is through the Great, the other one is through the Great Notch down here. And the third one was the Great Falls at Patterson. So any railroad that was going to connect the town of Montclair to Greenwood Lake would have to pass through the Great Notch. So in 1870, the newly chartered Caldwell and Montclair Railroad was about to take over the Great Notch. They were going to build a railroad between Montclair and Caldwell on, and lay their tracks through the Great Notch in Woodland Park or West Patterson. And that would mean that the Montclair Railroad would not be able to make it out of their namesake town. It would never reach Greenwood Lake. It would never become part of a larger system linking New York City to Lake Ontario. And here is a photograph of the Great Notch many years later. Uh, it's a 1950s era photograph of an Erie passenger local. You can see the Great Notch Stone Company, which is a major shipper on the line. But look at the um, mountains so close to the tracks and how it's kind of laid, the tracks are laid between these hills. 
So what happened was at a meeting of the Caldwell and Montclair Railroad, a group of the subscription books for the stock was opened. And a group of men from the Midland Railroad in New Jersey came to the meeting and subscribed massive amounts of stock. They obtained, they wrote checks for stock. They eventually became the majority stockholders in this railroad. They elected themselves the new board of directors. They took the subscription book, their checks, which never had to be cashed, and, and the charter of the new railroad and locked them all away so that their railroad, the Montclair Railroad, could obtain track, could lay its tracks through the Great Notch. So one crisis averted. But there was another problem that had to be solved. Greenwood Lake is in a narrow valley and getting into the valley is not such a big deal, but how are you gonna get back out of the valley, especially since there isn't enough money to even build a railroad in the first place, much less build a new line out of the green out of the valley of Greenwood Lake. So, having averted disaster at Great Notch and still without a plan for Greenwood Lake, the Montclair Railroad's directors soon realized that they were in facing a third crisis. They were racing the. Um, New Jersey Midland Railroad for one of the most valuable pieces of real estate in New Jersey, the headquarters of the Ponton River in Riverdale. So now if you've driven south from Greenwood Lake, West Milford on Greenwood Lake Turnpike, you know that this is a very flat section of New Jersey. If you've driven through Wayne Township or uh, driven through uh, Riverdale, you know it's flat. And that's very important because this flat spot surrounded by these mountains was the gateway, not just to Greenwood Lake, but the great way to Western for any railroad that would go to Western New Jersey. If you think about driving West on Route 23, you're following the valley of the Pequannock River and you have to and if you're gonna build a railroad west, you're gonna to need to follow the Pequannock River Valley. And if you're gonna do that, you need to control this area around Riverdale. So the Montclair Railroad was frantically building north and the New Jersey Midland Railroad was frantically building west. The New Jersey Midland would eventually become the New York Susquehanna, Hanna and Western Railroad. And whichever one of them reached this real estate first, that, that was the railroad that was going to be able to fulfill its ambitions. Well, unfortunately, the Midland Railroad reached Riverdale first. It controlled the land necessary to reach Greenwood Lake or Western and Western New Jersey. And as a result, the long anticipated railroad to Oswego, New York would be built by the New Jersey Midland and use this track. The Montclair Railroad no longer had or no longer needed to build or what the Montclair Railroad was no longer needed to serve as a connection to the Great Lakes. It would now become a purely local line. So trains were, trains were very soon quickly running to Oswego west from Riverdale over the New Jersey Midland Railroad and the Montclair Railroad would now have to come up with a plan B which would be to reach Greenwood Lake and reach the iron uh, furnaces in Ringwood. The railroad reached Ringwood and the shores of Greenwood Lake in early 1873, just in time for the panic of 1873 to destroy any hope of profitability. Now, remember what happened when Montclair sold its bonds. The town of Montclair sells the bonds 
money from the bond sale, purchases railroad income bonds, railroad revenues are paid back to the bondholders. But if there were no revenues, Montclair was now responsible for paying off the bondholders. So now what do we do? We see the um, railroad, however, quickly became a way to bring iron south from the Ringwood mines. And we see that among the early customers of this railroad as early as uh, 1868 were the Rogers Locomotive Works and the Danforth and Cook Locomotive Works in Patterson's. So the railroad was now making a, a transition to a more of a regional short line that was going to serve Greenwood Lake and serve the iron mines of uh, Ringwood and West Milford. Now, remember Julius Pratt? Now, Julius Pratt still maintained an interest in the um, Montclair Railroad. And he was serving as what was called the bondsman for the railroad, which meant that as a whole, as a major bondholder, he was responsible for helping pay off the debts that the railroad incurred. As a result, he uh, was personally on the hook for some money. And Abram S. Hewitt, who owned, who was the other major owner of the railroad at this time, was now running trains. Was, uh, the railroad was now in receivership. Excuse me, the railroad was now in receivership. Abram S. Hewitt was the receiver. He was going, he now had control of the railroad. But Julius H. Pratt insisted that Abram S. Hewitt owed him money. So the Montclair Railroad is shown here in this dark line. And here inside this little red box, just outside of Hoboken, Jersey City, is the New York Connecting Railroad. This was a short stretch of railroad that connected the Montclair Railroad with several of the others, several other local lines and brought that to Jersey City and the Hudson River Terminal. So one morning, while Abram S. Hewitt was nominally in control of the railroad, Julius H. Pratt was nominally in control of the Hudson Connecting Railroad, and he decided that it was a good time to do some track maintenance. So as the morning commuter trains were rushing east to Jersey City, they soon found that 300 feet of the track had been torn up. The passengers had to get out, walk past a smiling Julius H. Pratt, get back on a train, and they were very mad. They decided that they would hold an indignation meeting on the train and then would hold a public meeting in Montclair to resolve this issue. Now, Julius H. Pratt's memoirs were quite detailed about what happened at the meeting. After they were unable to find an honest Montclair man to chair the meeting, Julius H. Pratt stood up at the podium. He was being, he was being shouted down, but soon he was speaking to the crowd. He was telling them about all of the problems he was having dealing with Abram S. Hewitt. He was telling them about all the unfair treatment he was getting. And by the end of the meeting, the attendees unanimously rose up and pointed a committee to help Julius H. Pratt get his money from Abram S. Hewitt. At least that is what happened according to Pratt's memoirs. What really happened at the meeting, we don't know, but somehow this issue became resolved. So now if Hewitt and his partner, Marcus L. Ward, were good to get unfettered control 
over the over the Montclair Railroad, they would need to separate it from the syndicate that included the New Jersey Midland Railroad. So there were a number of schemes, a number of plans about what could be done with this railroad. Would this railroad simply be a local line hauling ore south and tourists to Greenwood Lake? A, a proposal arose to build south from Albany, connect to the Montclair Railroad at Greenwood Lake, or, and then have a railroad line connecting to the, to the New York waterfront, swinging west of all of the railroad congestion farther east on the New York waterfront. Here it's of course our, the railroad, uh, the Erie Railroad. So one, another proposal was that the Erie Railroad, which ran from Jersey City to Lake Erie would take over the railroad so that it would have a line that was 13 miles shorter down through Greenwood Lake to Jersey City. So the Re Erie Railroad saw that this could be a potentially very valuable connection between their main line between Jersey City and, and the Great Lakes. And they did not want this to fall under the control of a rival railroad. So the problems were continuing with the railroad. And after a long series of reorganization meetings, yet another reorganization meeting was called for July 17th, 1878. So what happened at this meeting is that there was going to be a committee of bondholders who was going to purchase the Montclair Railroad the bondholders would get control over the railroad and they could operate it profitably and get their money back. Unfortunately, Abram S. Hewitt stepped in and he's rather than buy the railroad on behalf of the bondholders, several days before the sale, he sold his interest to the Erie. So now whoever owned the railroad next, whatever happened at the bankruptcy sale, the Erie Railroad would now control the Montclair, the Montclair Railroad. Now the Montclair Railroad was in receivership at the time and State Senator Garrett A. Hobart, best remembered today as McKinley's vice president, he was appointed receiver to for the railroad. And under his receivership, when with the sale to the Erie, the railroad finally emerged from an embarrassing series of bankruptcies. So Hewlett sold his last remaining stake in the railroad to the Erie in 1898, but some of the descendants of some of the original bondholders would keep their holdings until 1942. So what had become, what had started out as a, a, a railroad that was going to link Jersey City to the Great Lakes, eventually became a purely local line, a, a branch of the Erie Railroad that was going to serve the towns of Bloomfield, Montclair, through the Great Notch, uh, to Little Falls, Wayne, and finally in 1876, Sterling Forest at Greenwood Lake. The Sterling Forest Station was particularly important for the community and for the not just for the railroad. And uh, we have a 1918 valuation map of the green of the station at Sterling Forest, which is on the east shore of Greenwood Lake. Here is the New York New Jersey border 
Here, here is the lake. You can see there's a number of uh, facilities on the lake. There was a turntable, a, uh, a large passenger station, a large steamboat dock, uh, pass, um, runaround tracks, and then extending north from Sterling Forest just over the state line were the ice houses owned by the um, Greenwood Lake Ice Company, which was owned by Abram S. Hewitt. Now, there is a number of different types of passengers that rode the um, trains to Greenwood Lake. You had the very affluent passengers who could afford to stay at their summer house. You could have a sl slightly less affluent who could afford to have an extended stay at a boarding house or a hotel, some of, for the entire summer. You had the day trippers who could travel to the lake as part of a church or fraternal organization uh, excursion. You also had local people who grew up in the region and were now living in the larger cities like New York or Jersey City, and were now coming back on weekends. And of course, there was the occasional passenger from the Greenwood Lake, West Milford area who would take the train to the big city. When the, tu when the tourists arrived at Sterling Forest, they could board the steamer Montclair. The Montclair had a capacity of around 250 passengers and she was put on Greenwood Lake by the Montclair Railroad and then became part of the Greenwood Lake Navigation Company, which was affiliated with the Erie Railroad. So we think of these steamboats not as part of an independent steamboat company, but actually as part of the Erie Railroad's uh, Marine Department. The Montclair was a very popular boat and served all of the lakeside hotels and boarding houses. The Montclair, was joined by several smaller boats, the Anita, Milford, and Arlington. They were cheaper to operate than the far larger Montclair, and they could meet trains, trains during the off season or um, supplement the larger steamboat. During the winter months, the locals did not need these boats. They could drive on the ice directly to the station at Sterling Forest. And there are, are stories about how the local mail ca letter carriers would bring their sleds to meet the mail trains or to meet the trains at Sterling Forest and bring the post to the village of Greenwood Lake. There are tales about how the children uh, who were going to school in Greenwood Lake would also use the steamboats to get to school. But of course, the primary reason to have these boats on the lake was to haul the tourists who came up in the summer. And here is a photograph, an uh, old postcard at the, of the Anita at the Sterling Forest Dock. You could see a number of canoes and rowboats, which were available to rent. And Greenwood Lake, of course, had many attractions. Among them was fishing. The going rate at the turn of the 20th century was $2 for a guide and boat rentals anywhere from 50 cents to $1. And here is a photograph of an excursion party who came to the lake uh, from Montclair in the mid 1800s. And if you were gonna spend a day at Greenwood Lake, you might spend it at a place like the Glens Casino. This was a destination for day trippers. You could come, use the beach, rent a boat, attend a dance in the afternoon, or just sit on the shoreline and look out on the lake. Picnic facilities like this became a very important earner for the Montclair and Greenwood Lake Railroad. There was also a swimming beach near Chapel Island, near the north end of the lake, and it was a very popular in the summer. Chapel Island itself took its name for the fact that there was a church on the island and that on Sundays, 
a flotilla of boats would gather outside the church to attend uh, services. It was a very, uh, very popular event. A lot of people bought postcards and wrote home about it. You could rent rowboats, you could row around the lake, you can go swimming, you can go fishing. There are all sorts of things to do at Greenwood Lake. So just to give you a, uh, an idea of the number of uh, facilities that were available catering to the tourists, every triangle here on the lake shore is a hotel or a boarding house. This, would, this was a map around, again, around 1900. The railroad had only had two facilities on the lake, at Cooper and at a Sterling Forest. So what were some of the attractions for tourists? Or what were some of the uh, amenities that you could uh, enjoy if you were visiting one of the hotels at Greenwood Lake? I like the Fuller House, which was very popular with hunters. Uh, and they did not charge extra if you brought your dog. The Lakeside Hotel or the Lakeside House advertised its good steamboat connections with the railroad. The Brandon House and Widmere Hotel had fairly, um, fairly large, 56 and 40 rooms. The Valley View House advertised that it was open year round. The Lakeside Hotel advertised that it had 32 rooms and children were half price. Willow Point and the Point Peter House was somewhat smaller at 18 rooms. Now, during the winter, of course, uh, the lake froze over and ice harvesting was a major industry on Greenwood Lake. This provided a lot of valuable employment for many of the men who lived in the community when the tourists had gone home and when the local farms did not need any help. Here is the 1918 valuation map showing the ice house on the shore of Greenwood Lake and the track coming up to the ice house and hauling ice south from Greenwood Lake was a big part of the Montclair and Greenwood Lakes revenue stream, particularly in the hot summer. Now, some of you may know uh, about the Weiss Ecology Center or the Nature Friends Camp or the um, a facility in Ringwood. In 1920, a New York uh, organization called the Nature Friends purchased a farm and 42 acres. We named it Camp Midvale. It was out, they were outdoor enthusiasts, many uh, made up from working class German immigrants, but they enjoyed skiing, they enjoyed hiking, they enjoyed other sorts of outdoor sports. Many of us know this property again as the Weiss Ecology Center. And the railroad did run trains to Midvale for, uh, and people would come down with a, uh, a shuttle bus and provide rides to the uh, farm, the Nature Friends Camp. It was never uh, a pop, it was never a very large destination in terms of passenger numbers, but a number of people who stayed at the camp this is the main dormitory, or came there for skiing, uh, would have rode the trains. Now, it's interesting that ski trains became a very big part of railroads in the 1930s. Uh, you know, if you live in the Warwick area, Greenwood Lake area, you know about Mount Peter. That was founded in the 1930s. Camp Midvale had a ski run. And there was never, though, the Montclair and Greenwood Lake Railroad or the Greenwood Lake Branch never really uh, took advantage, was able to take advantage of winter sports traffic. The town of Greenwood Lake tried to get a toboggan run going and an ice skating rink going to bring tourists up during the winter. Unfortunately, they found that people uh, got hurt on the toboggan run and got hurt ice skating and they spent all of, their, all of their revenue on medical bills for the injured tourists. 
never became a big winter, winter sports destination. And by 1935, the railroad no longer ran to the lake. So this was a kind of a missed opportunity for passenger traffic. Now, before we leave the uh, topic of Greenwood Lake, I think that the, uh, the postcard, the person who wrote this postcard should have the last word on Greenwood Lake. And this person had this postcard of Sterling Forest. We see a small steam, two small steam launches here, no doubt bringing tourists to the hotels, some boxcars being unloaded with supplies for the hotels. And she, uh, this person simply wrote, loving the place. And I think that is a sentiment that a great many of us would uh, agree with. Now, Abram S. Hewitt was nominally in control of the railroad until he sold the last of his holdings out at, to the Erie. But his daughter, um, organized a unit of the Emergency Service Corps near Erskine. Now, this was done during the First World War, and this shows Martha Stone Gay in her Emergency Services Corps uniform. Now, a lot of young women in the time of the First World War, they spoke French and they knew how to drive, so they were very much in demand as ambulance drivers on the Western Front. Young women who wanted to go to France for uh, uh, duty behind the lines could go to the emergency services camp, and they were trained in shooting, military skills, hiking, and other activities. Okay. I like this photograph because it shows how well maintained the track was going up through Erskine toward the iron mines of Ringwood and the little flagstop shelter uh, that uh, was provided for passengers. Incidentally, not, I, don't, I don't think any of the women who trained at camp, uh, camp uh, at this particular camp actually did go to France but they were, uh, they were preparing to go to France, working as ambulance drivers, telephone operators, interpreters, and other duties behind the lines. The other major event that happened to the railroad at this time was the construction of the Wanaku Reservoir beginning in 1922. Now this would require the railroad to be relocated out of the reservoir bed and the, the line you see today as you drive north uh, or south along the Wanaku Reservoir was the is the relocated line. Where as the passenger uh, revenues began to decline, the Erie put a number of gas electric cars on the route to Greenwood Lake and along the Ringwood branch. And finally, with automobiles um, coming, the, the lake was accessible for more and more people. Ridership was dropping, and the last train to the lake ran in 1935. And this is a photograph of that last train. The roadbed was acquired by Passaic County for conversion uh, to roads. Uh, it's the other major industry at the northern end of the railroad was, of course, the iron works. This shows the spur going into the iron mines. And here we see uh, Erie, Erie train is going to be loaded with uh, from the 38th gauge Dinky line. In 1878, a narrow gauge tramway was completed from the Ringwood station to the Pope Mine, Peter's Mine, and Blue Mine and Cannon Mines. And the 
narrow gauge steam locomotive hauled the ore cars up to the mines and young boys rode them down to um, uh, controlling the brake wheels until they got to the Ringwood station where there was a transloading facility. Uh, then they were coupled back up to the locomotive and hauled back up to the mines. This uh, went on to the, round, the time of the First World War when the railroad was extended from, uh, this would be the Ringwood station extended to the Peters mine, the Cooper mine, the uh, Cannon and Blue Mines. This was the, the Dinky Line was closed in 1912. The standard gauge tracks then reached the last two of the operating mines, the Peters Mine and the Cannon Mine. So of the, by the 1912, these were the only mines still operational. And here we see a map from the uh, New Jersey Geological Survey talking about are showing the surface workings and the railroad connections at the Peters mine. So you had the railroad coming in here. You see the hoisting house. The mine itself is uh, shown by these um, lines here. And the uh, ore skips went were lowered down into the mine um, and hauled up and the trains were loaded here. Here you see one of the entrances to the Peters mine. And here are the surface workings of the cannon mine. So these were not small inconsequential little operations. These are actually fairly uh, substantial mining operations. Now, if you've read uh, Jim Ransom's book, Vanishing Ironworks of the Ramapos, you'll, uh, you'll remember that in 1942, the Defense Department purchased the Peters mine for the war effort. They built a number, they got the mines ready to operate. They um, poured concrete for concrete structures. They had a thickener tank, a dynamite storehouse, a miner's emergency escape, uh, found, uh, found the, the skip house, and to help move the ore out of the mine, the US Navy loaned them two 70 ton General Electric diesels. As it turns out, they really weren't needed. And in, and let's see, in 1961, these two military locomotives were run from the mine and sold to another mining company in the Midwest. This was the last train movement north of Midvale or Midvale Wanakew on the Greenwood Lake Branch. After the resort was no longer served by the railroad, we saw a number of suburban developments. One of the earliest and biggest ones in the 1930s on the shore of Greenwood Lake was the a development of, of a woasting by the Ringwood Company. They no longer had an iron mine, so now they were turning to real estate development. Um, the railroad was gone by the time they began building this real estate development. So ironically, for all the years that the railroad served Greenwood Lake, the people buying these homes and using this clubhouse were not going to be commuting on the railroad. Instead, the northern end of the railroad was in the town of Wanaku, and this would be the northern terminal for all passenger service until 1965. We see a number of steam locomotives laying over in Wanaku between runs, and eventually the suburban service was taken over by Stillwell coaches with Alco road switchers. And you can see several photographs of the commuter trains passing south. Another major industry that the railroad served in the 1960s were the sand pits. 
in the area of Riverdale and Pequannock. The sand was Ramapo, um, Wanaku, Riverdale, and Pequannock. The sand was needed for highway construction and it was very useful for construction of concrete aggregates. So here we see a sand train uh, in the operating, I think in Riverdale in this case. And here is a line of hopper cars going to be loaded at the Brewster sand pit. The Brewster uh, company operated this sand pit. They brought these hopper, they brought uh, trains of hopper cars loaded with sand south along the Greenwood Lake branch. Much of the sand went for the construction of Route 80 across the Hackensack Meadowlands. Jim Costabas, who was, a railroad, who was an engineer on this railroad for many years and worked on a number of other positions, he brought his camera to work with him uh, many days and he took uh, this photograph. And he was really very instrumental in being able to write this book. Now, this photograph in 1969, around 1969, supposedly shows the last uh, cars that were ever loaded or last freight cars ever brought out of Wanaku. The Erie Lackawanna sought permission to abandon the line to the to Wanaku Midvale in 1969. And then when the bridge over the Wanaku River collapsed in 1971, there was no possibility for the renewal of service. Now, of course, the town of Ramapo is world famous as the site of several UFO sightings in January of 1966. Um, but uh, skeptics attribute the UFOs to a phenomena called earthquake lights, which result from the static electricity generated uh, by tectonic faults. But a lot of people believe that Wanaku was the site of an alien visitation in the mid 1960s. And this was actually, the UFOs were spotted just uh, off of the, just at the location where the Brewster sand pit was located. I'd like to show you some of the local freight operations that survived into the 1970s. This was in Riverdale. Again, another one in Riverdale. No, there is not a steam locomotive servicing the team track. This was en route to a railroad museum and was part of the local freight that day. We, a uh, number of industries were served in Pequannock. And then I was fortunate enough to photograph the last operations of this railroad north of Mountain View Wayne in Pequannock. There was a local feed dealer that was getting regular shipments of grain. And that came to an end with the coming of Conrail in the uh, mid 1970s. Okay, so south of Wayne Township here on the New Jersey uh, transit map, became part of New Jersey Transit's Montclair Booten Line, which links Hoboken to Hackettstown. And before I close, remember this guy? Well, you, you may want to, because remember what happened in the, uh, in the town of Montclair. The Newark and Bloomfield Railroad did not want to extend itself into the town of Montclair. It had uh, a one passenger coach and one locomotive and earned the grand, the princely sum of about $600 its first year of operation. So Montclair was served by the Newark and Bloomfield, which connected to the Morris and Essex, which became the Lackawanna. Newark and Bloomfield didn't want to extend to Montclair. Montclair built his own railroad, which became the Erie's Greenwood Lake branch. So here is a 
um, period map from 1906 showing the rather extensive operations that the Lackawanna had in downtown Montclair, its connection to the streetcar lines, its service for the local industries, and the terminal that the Lackawanna built in the town of Montclair uh, has since been redeveloped into an indoor to a shopping mall, but it was part of the suburban electrification and uh, was a significant source of traffic at first, although uh, ridership began to drop and drop and drop. So by the time um, Conrail was formed and New Jersey Transit was thinking about consolidating its lines, the idea of linking the Montclair the Erie, Lac the Lackawanna's electrified line in Montclair to the Erie's line in Montclair came to the forefront. And in 2002, a short length of connecting track brought the trains from the Erie's Greenwood Lake branch to the Montclair, uh, to the Lackawanna's Montclair branch, the original Montclair and Greenwood Lake tracks that connected it to the Hudson River and Jersey City were um, became freight only. And plans to convert this line into a rail trail have recently been announced. Another rails to trails project is occurring in. Morris County with a walking trail being constructed on the railroad bed between Mountain View and Riverdale. The Pequannock Railroad Station has now become the township's museum. This is in the Pompton Plains section of Pequannock and has been lovingly restored by the township. The original railroad between Montclair and Wayne continues to be a part of the New, Jer New Jersey Transit Montclair Booten line and sees the number of passenger trains every day. So if you just want to have um, some uh, a su quick summary of some of the important points that we, uh, we've seen in the history of the railroad, we see the uh, new tracks laid to the mines in 1912, the Wanaku Reservoir was created, the Peters Mine was closed, the last train to Greenwood Lake. The Erie and the Lackawanna Railroads merged and the Jersey City Terminal was closed so that every train was now going through Hoboken. In 1963, we had the construction of Route 80 and the need for sand trains to be operated out of Wanaku. Then we had the last train from Wanaku, which, um, Shortly thereafter, Wanaku became world famous as a, a site of UFO sightings. Sometime around 1977, the last freight trains were operating north of Mountain View. And in 2002, the Montclair Connection opened so that after waiting since 1858, the citizens of Montclair finally had their connection to Jersey City via the Morris, uh, the, the uh, Montclair and Bloomfield. And who says there's no such thing as progress? Well, I'm sorry to have nattered on for quite so long, but I hope you've uh, enjoyed the presentation and uh, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions.